Act One of Mrs. Pretty and the Premier by Arthur Adams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mrs. Pretty and the Premier, a political comedy in three acts. The persons in the comedy. Herbert Dix, the Premier's Chief Private Secretary, read by Peter Musgrove. Effie Bim, stenographer in the Premier's room. Read by Devorah Allen. Gregory, chief messenger at Parliament House. Read by Alan Mapstone. William Power, Premier. Read by Son of the Exiles. Patrick O'Reilly, a constituent. Read by T.J. Burns. Edward Voice, the party whip. Read by Leanne Yao. Martha Callender, the Premier's sister, read by Beth Thomas. Charles Lucan, reporter on the Tribune, read by Thomas Peter. Helen Pretty, a widow, the owner of Wyanora Estate, read by Sonia. Mrs. Cusack, a friend of Mrs. Pretty's, read by Sandra Schmidt. Vernon Harrington, leader of the opposition, read by Ken Harrington. Maid, read by Lian Yao. Stage directions read by Todd. The action takes place in the Premier's room at Parliament House, Acts 1 and 3, and in the living room of Wyonora Homestead, Mrs. Pretty's estate, Act 2. The period is the present, the action being comprised within a few days. Act 1. Scene. If you wish to see William Power, the Premier of a certain Australian state, you would first have to wait in the lobby of Parliament House while Gregory, the chief messenger, took in your card. If the premier is disengaged, which isn't at all likely, you will probably have to wait your turn. You would be shown into the premier's private office. There, behind a big table, covered with documents, you would find William Power awaiting you. While he finished scrawling his big signature over official documents, you would have time to notice the room. It is a big, comfortably furnished room, lit by big windows at the back, and with a private entrance for the premier. On the table, you would notice a huge vase of flowers, a desk telephone, etc. Chairs here and there. Portraits of bygone premiers haughtily stare from the walls at this representative of labor who has succeeded them. A small table and chair are set down in the corner for a stenographer, so placed that the reporter's back is right in the corner. Behind the big table is a large screen, concealing from sight a comfortable armchair beneath the windows at the back. The purpose of this arrangement, it may be confessed, is to allow the premier the chance of a nap in the intervals of his strenuous work, while his decorous secretary can let the importunate caller see for himself that the room is empty. Prominent above the door is the division bell, used to summon members to the chamber when a division is to be taken. The rest of the furniture includes a table for the premier's chief private secretary, he has seven, and a tiny table and chair for a stenographer, with the usual office furnishings, including a desk telephone on the secretary's table. The door by which you entered from the lobby is in the back wall. There is also a smaller door. It is the morning of a fine day. Herbert Dix, the premier's chief private secretary, is seated at his table, working with calm fury, methodically clearing up the heaps of papers ready for the premier's perusal and signature. He is a capable, youngish man, emotionless, blasé to politics, suave, brisk, and resourceful. And to be a private secretary to such a tornado of energy as William Power, he needs to be all that. His desk telephone rings. Yes, Premier's room. Who? Reporter, yes. Which paper? The Tribune. What's the Tribune want with the Premier? Oh, it's you, Lucan. Must see the Premier this morning, eh? Impossible. No, he's not down yet. Expect him any minute but he won't see you, told me only yesterday, and rather forcibly, that after the way your paper distorted his speech, he wouldn't see anybody from the Tribune till they apologised, so you see, there's no chance. Sorry, what's that? He'll be only too anxious to see you when he knows what you got hold of? Concerns him personally, you say. Can't help that. If the thing's so urgent, why didn't you ring him up at his private address? Couldn't get him. 
He hadn't been home all night. Oh, he told me where he was going, if that's all your story. Well, I'll tell him you're here when he arrives. Better come down right away. Right? He replaces phone. To himself, seriously. The Premier wasn't home all night. Never known him to do that before. Curious. He dives into his work again. Effie Bim, a meek little girl of the worshipping type, enters quietly through the small door. She is wearing the conventional blouse and skirt, but has given way to her feminine love of adornment by crowning herself with a particularly virulent scarlet hat. Effie stands a moment, self-curious, looking at Dix, confidently expecting from him some admiring comment. Good morning, Mr. Dix. Morning, Miss Bim. You're late, as usual. He is too busy to look up. Effie, disappointed, sighs, and reverently removes the hat and rapturously admires it. Crossing to the small door, she calmly removes Dix's hat from its peg and places her hat there. Dix's hat she relegates to a lower hook. Then she returns to her small table, sits, opens her typewriter, and starts typing letters without enthusiasm. Miss Bim, did you hear Bill say anything yesterday about not going home last night? Goodness, no, Mr. Dix. Didn't he go home last night? I heard not. Then where did he sleep? Oh, the Premier doesn't sleep. Hasn't the time to waste. It couldn't have been a woman. A woman? You women are always looking for the woman. That is, when you're not looking for the man. The Premier interested in a woman. You know what Bill thinks of females. Haven't I cause? He doesn't even see them. I bet he's never seen me. Sees you every hour of the day. Can't help it. No more can I. Effie, rising tragically. No, he looks through me. He doesn't know I exist except as a kind of pianola attachment to a typewriter. Well, that's what you are. You're not paid a screw for being a woman, are you? No, but you'd think that any man, even if he is a premier, would become conscious, in time, of the presence of a woman if she was always about, and he's never even noticed what I've got on or how I do my hair. Since I came here, I've done it nine different ways, too. You'd think that any man... Bill isn't a man. He's merely a premier, a sort of political dynamo running the country at top speed. And he's always been like that. He's worked too hard all his life to spare the time to get married. I often wonder why he never did. I like to think that he had some disappointment when he was young, some sacred memory to which his heart is forever faithful, some faded little portrait that he wears next his heart. Dix, with a shriek of delight at the picture. Bill! Ah, uh, you're only a man. It takes a woman's intuition to know that some day... Some day, you think, he'll switch that whirring dynamo of his on to lovemaking, and then there'll be an earthquake? My dear Miss Bim, you're a capable typewriter, but your mind is soggy with sentiment. Politics aren't romantic. No, that's the greatest disappointment of my life. But some day... That's why I got that new hat. Good Lord, is that a hat? Striking, don't you think? Blinding. You mean to say you got that for Bill? Yes. If he catches sight of that conflagration, well, you know Bill's capacity for language, but you've never heard him in full blast with the valve blown off. While there's time, you'd better take it up with the tongs and bury it in the backyard. You think he'll really notice it? If he's not colorblind. Of course, I'd like him to see it on. You can never judge a hat off. I'll show you. Don't waste it on me. I've just had breakfast. Let me see that letter to the education department. Effie returns to her desk and searches. Oh, I left it on the other desk. She crosses to the small table. Returning with the letter, she notices the vase of flowers on the premier's table, goes up and rearranges them, and lightly kisses the flowers. Then she sees on the floor a little gold mesh handbag. She picks it up. Oh. Dix, without looking up. Hurry. Look what I found. Dix, rising. What's that? Uh, stupid. A lady's handbag. Expensive looking, too. Where did you get it? On the floor. A lady's handbag in the Premier's room. And Bill never went home last night. Oh, it was a woman. Nonsense. Somebody left it yesterday. But the cleaners always do out the room after the Premier goes. That's so. She left it last night. The abandoned creature. And I did think Mr. Power. There's sure to be some simple explanation. Well, we'll soon find out. She begins to open the bag. He snatches it. Here? 
You're not going to open it. I only want to find out the creature's name and address, to send it back. No, you don't. This isn't our affair. Put it back exactly where you found it, quick. He'll be in any minute now. Effie unwillingly puts it back on the floor. And get on with your work. Effie, returning to her desk and stabbing rapidly and viciously at the typewriter keys. So it was a woman. Oh, a rich woman, too. Gregory enters. He is an old man, who having been in the privileged position of chief messenger for many years, long before the present premier took office, looks on premiers with a kind of paternal interest. As he is always called Gregory, his other name does not matter, nor is there probably any other person who knows it. Gregory, coming to Dix with a handful of visiting cards and forms, filled in by persons stating their business with the premier, waiting in the lobby. Morning, sir. Hello, Gregory. The usual crowd waiting in the lobby. Two deputations and a mob of outer works. Lucan, the chap from the Tribune. Reading the card. Personal, of the utmost urgency. I wonder if he knows anything about that. Any ladies, Gregory? Ladies, Mr. Dix? No, thank God. I always hates to see ladies calling on premiers. But Bill hates them too. By the way... There was a lady here late yesterday afternoon. I told her Bill wouldn't be in if he didn't turn up before six. She said she'd wait. I left her in the lobby. Give her name? No. As Bill didn't turn up, I suppose she got tired and went. Must have. She wasn't there when I came back from me tea. You'd all gone by then, sir. Any special callers out there now? None that I couldn't dispose of myself, sir. Of course, you could run the country yourself, couldn't you? No, but I've been here so long as Premier's messenger that I know more about that crowd than any Premier would. I recollect all their faces. I could tell you what every blessed son of a gun wants. What every blessed son of a gun wants is a government job. Exactly, sir. I've been here almost since there were premiers. I've seen five come and go, and I'll see lots more come and go. If Bill had only let me take his interviewing off his shoulders, he might stay a little longer than the others. You won't see Bill go unless he explodes from too much energy. He's a sticker. So they all thought they were, sir. Gregory goes out. That newspaper chap with his urgent personal interview, and that woman waiting yesterday, and that handbag? I don't quite like the look of it. Here he comes. She types furiously. A voice, a loud domineering voice, is heard outside the Premier's private door. The door is flung open. William Power, the Labour Premier, enters. He is a big man of middle age, with rough, strong features. He recognises that he is the autocrat of the state, has a fierce belief in himself, and looks the typical successful politician. With all, he is a likable man, with a large heart and a boisterous manner, and a sense of kindly humor. He is well versed in all the tricks of his trade, ready to win by cunning where straight dealing will not do. He is a man of the people, dressed now, without ostentation, in a morning suit, well cut. He radiates the instant impression of immense willpower and physical force. As he enters, he is in the middle of dictating a telegram to his second private secretary, Ernest Bristed, a colorless young man who enters behind him, making rapid shorthand notes in his notebook. Power, dictating as he pauses at the door, to Bristed, as yet unseen. Must have information by return. Got that? Bristed appears. Wire Postmaster General. Dix brings a bundle of documents, which he places on the table. Good morning, sir. Morning, Dix. Hands him his tall hat, which Dix hangs up. Postmaster General. Dictating to Bristed. Find two places for telephone girls at Baraboo Exchange. Immediate. Write Postmaster General, giving names. Dix knows all about that. Telephone Vice, see me at once. Send messenger to my house to fetch two clean handkerchiefs. Order special train for midnight for Molong. Reprimand Porter for not supplying hot foot warmers last trip. Bring the matter under notice of the Chief Commissioner and tell him from me that if his rotten railways can't provide hot foot warmers for the Premier, 
I'll get a question asked about it in the house. You come with me, Breasted, in the special. And two other secretaries. Dick stays here. Prepare a speech for the opening of the new public library at Molong. Some rot about culture and the working man. Culture! I never found any need of it. Telegraph that fool, Brown, that if he thinks he's going to win Wyanora by election for us, he'd better get a move on. There's a complaint from Dead Cow Corner that he's never spoken there. And there are thirteen good government votes waiting for him there. I'm sending up three members of the cabinet to help. Tell him not to be too damn definite in his speeches. It's easily seen he's never been in Parliament before. He's committing the government too much. Keep to generalities. Generalities never did anyone much harm. That's all for now. First Dead disappears. By this time, Power is seated at the table. He glances rapidly at the letters placed before him by Dix, pencils brief memos on them, and scrawls his big signature over other documents. Power, to Dix, who stands waiting. Any deputations, Whiten? Two. Duplication of railways and totalizator bill. I'll keep. Send in the others. Yes, sir. Where's that draft of the compulsory resumptions of estates bill? Dix, indicating it on the table. Here, sir. This'll give the big squatters hell, eh? They've been looking for it for a long while, sir. He rings the bell and signals Effie. Effie rises with notebook and crosses. Good morning, sir. Power, busy scanning the bill, not looking up. Morning. Effie sits at the small table, her back to the corner, ready to take shorthand notes of the interviews. Gregory shows in Patrick O'Reilly, an ancient man, cringing and persuasive. Thank you, stars, Patrick O'Reilly, that you've got the sort of face that you only see in a zoo. If I didn't remember you, you'd be waiting outside in the lobby all the morning. What do you want with the Premier? Sure. What we all of us do be wantin'. A job. But you got a job from the last Premier. Didn't he make you a night watchman? I lost that job. I couldn't keep awake after supper, could I? I told Sir Charles about you, but he said you was a tenant on his estate in England. And he never forgot old friends. Now, did I tell him that? I've got the worst memory a man was ever blessed with. I never was in England. I knew Bill Power in the days of the gold rush, when he used to keep a store. Him and me was great friends, leastwise. Oh, he was. This Premier always remembers old friends, too. But maybe he won't remember me. You just hop in and tell him I knew him in the good old days. You're the third man in this week who knew Bill Power when he kept a store on the diggings. Come on. He ushers Patrick in. To Power. Mr. Patrick O'Reilly, sir, who knew you in the gold digging days. Power, genially grasping Patrick's hand. Always glad to meet an old friend. I remember you perfectly, Pat. I was a customer when you kept that store, sir. Don't you remember? I owed you seven shillings. Do you? Holds out his hand for it. Gregory retires. I have my checkbook handy, sir. Well, what can I do for you, Pat? Just a little bit of a job, sir. Certainly. What sort of job do you want? Any job, sir, where I don't have to keep awake. A clerkship in one of the government departments? Dix! Dix brings an open letter in his hand. Any vacancies for temporary clerkships in the Treasury? Overstaffed, sir. Tell the Undersecretary to make one for my friend Mr. Patrick O'Reilly. Yes, sir. And instruct the Undersecretary to deduct seven shillings? No, seven shillings and sixpence. Interest. From his first month's salary and pay it into my private account. Yes, sir. By the way, there's a note from the Undersecretary about that man you sent to him yesterday. Here it is. What does the blighter say? Says he can't give your appointee a position as a clerk, despite your personal recommendation. But damn it, I told him to. Why? Dix, reading. Because your man can't read or write. Power snatches the letter, doubles up one corner, scribbles on it, and hands it back. 
Can't read all right, eh? There. Dex, reading. Teach him. William Power. That ought to get over the trifling difficulty, sir. Would you mind, sir, just putting them little words on me own appointment paper? Of course. To Dex. Fix my friend O'Reilly up. Thank you, sir. Glory be. You're the sort of premier that we'll have soon in Ireland. They shake hands, and Dix shows Patrick out. Power turns again to scrutinize the draft of the bill. Gregory enters with a card, which he shows to Dix. Dix, back at his desk. The premier never sees women. She said he was sure to see her. Well, try him. Gregory comes to Power. Sir, there's a lady... I never see ladies. That's what I told her, sir. But she said when you saw her card, you'd see her. Power, suddenly interested. Perhaps it's... He snatches the card and reads. Mrs. Arthur Pretty. No, not her. But I know the name. What's her business? She's the owner of Wynora Estate, sir. Ah, the owner of Wynora. The biggest run in the state. The first one we're going to compulsorily resume. So she comes to me to make a personal appeal to leave her her estate. She believes I'm the sort of fool to capitulate to a fascinating face. I suppose she is fascinating, Gregory? As dangerous, I should say, sir, as a death adder. Well, I won't see her. Thank you, sir. Thank you? I'm doing it in self-defence. That's why, sir. There's one sore face that I don't like to see among the crowd out there in the lobby, and that's a woman's. What woman? Any woman, sir. They're all death adders. Oh, I don't worry about women. No time. No, sir. But when they begin to worry about you, and especially when they're widows... How do you know she's a widow? Instinct, sir. The blind instinct that frightens a bird when it sees a snake. Mrs. Arthur Pretty is a widow. There, I knew it, sir. Instinct. You remember Mr. Beatty, sir. He was premier ten year ago. He lost his job through a widow. And there was Mr. Perkins. He looked good for a lifetime in that chair. And when I saw a pretty woman patiently waiting in the lobby to see him on private business, and my instinct warned me she was a widow, I knew. He lost his job three weeks later. Then my fate is in your hands, Gregory. Don't let him in, except over your dead body. You can't keep him out, sir, when they've got on a new hat. Has Mrs. Pretty got on a new hat? It looks guilty, sir. Then tell her to put herself and her new hat into writing. Dix knows how to deal with letters. Thank you, sir. But you can't always keep them out, not this sort. To Dix. No, he won't see her, but she'll see him. Nonsense. She's the persistent variety. How do you know? She was the lady who was waiting here all yesterday afternoon. Dix, sharply, interested. Has she a handbag? I didn't notice one today, but she had a gold thing yesterday. What's her name? Oh, Mrs. Arthur Pretty. Oh, it's only business. She wants Bill to save her estate from being resumed. He told me to tell her to put her request in writing, but she won't. Gregory goes out. Edward Vice enters through the private door. He is the party whip, an old and experienced politician. Effie gets up as soon as she sees him, and crosses to her desk, where she starts typing. Waiting for you, Vice. Came as soon as I got your phone, Bill. What about the by-election? I think we'll just about win. Damn it, Vice! We must win! Don't I know that. We can't carry on much longer with our small majority. But this compulsory resumption of estates, Bill, of yours, ought to be our trump card. Especially as it is in Wyanora electorate. And Wyanora estate is the biggest in the country. And the emptiest. The emptiest? Yes. Look here. Compulsory resumption of estates, Bill, sounds rather... rather thin, eh? I've got it. Compulsory resumption of empty estates, Bill. How's that to catch the votes for us? 
The very thing. Bill, you're a genius. That'll be worth a hundred votes to us. And we'll barely need that hundred. Everybody knows that Wyanora Estate is only a sheep run. And all the landless votes in that district. Every little Tory farmer wants a cut of that big, rich kike. We'll rake them all in. Nah, you put it badly. He rises. What the government is thinking of is all that fine land locked up for a sheep run. The railway runs right through it, and the country wants people, human souls, not silly sheep. That's so. People have votes, for us, and sheep haven't. Though, personally, I wouldn't mind if the sheep had. We could depend on their votes. Think of all that rich country subdivided into little farms, with big prosperous families singing a paean of gratitude to us, where now there are only sheep tracks and boundary riders. You always were an optimist, Bill. But I see you've got your election speech prepared. Power, working himself up. And what title has the owner? What did he ever do to make Wyanora rich? What had he to do with the railway? we've brought right up to his back door. Steady on, old man. It isn't a he, it's a she. So it is. Mrs. Pretty. Why, I forgot to tell you. Mrs. Pretty is here now. Here? Waiting in the lobby. Come to plead to you. To appeal to your chivalry and your better instincts. Yes, in writing. She's a fascinating woman, they say. That's why. Aren't you a little scared of women, Bill? Scared to hell. Why? You can't bluff a woman. Why, I can't bluff my own sister. She treats me like a kid. Calls me her little willy. He returns to his table and sits. Her little willy. Bill, sometimes I'm afraid you'll fall in. It's always the scared ones who do. No fear. Gregory keeps them out. He's scared too. Those reports from Wyanora ought to be in now. I'll let you know if there's any new development. He retires. Gregory shows in Martha Callender. Mrs. Callender, the Premier's sister, is a widow, fat, genial, shrewd, and commonplace. Her brother's astonishing rise to power has not altered her one whit. Martha, at a loss, showing that she has never visited her brother's office before. Where's Willie? I'm the Premier's sister. Inside, Mrs. Callender. He shows her in. Hello, Martha. What brings you here? Well, you know, Willie, where were you last night? I was working late. Too late to go home. You can't deceive your elder sister, Willie. There's been disgraceful goings on, there has. But you'll please remember that you can't sully the name of power without your sister protesting. And a respectable name, thank goodness, it has always been. The powers has always been sober folk and honest workmen. Your father was the best plumber in the whole colony. And if you did run away to the gold diggings instead of following his trade and kept a store, you've lived that down since you went into politics. And to think that now you're old enough to know better, you stay out all night. But I told you I was working so late that... And you didn't tell me the truth, Willie. Oh, I know politicians don't, but this isn't politics. It's your sister. I waited up for you till one o'clock last night, and I had a nice hot supper waiting on the new gas stove. My word, Willie, that was a great idea of yours, the gas stove. I was always fond of the kitchen range. Many's a good dinner I've cooked on a range for poor Henry. But where he's gone now, I don't suppose he'll need hot dinners. And mind ye, I'm not saying that for cooking a joint the range isn't the best, but for keeping a supper hot, all you have to do is turn the gas low, though I doubt but that you'll find it expensive. And at last I had to turn the gas out, and I hardly slept a wink thinking of my Willie spending the night in the glittering haunts of wickedness. My dear Martha, I can look after myself. And that's just what you can't do. You've got a good job now, a better job than poor Henry ever had, though if he did drink a bit, who am I to blame him? And they give you a fine big room to work in, and I've no doubt you can run the country all right. The powers were always pretty good bluffers, but you need a woman to look after you. So this morning, when that messenger in uniform came to fetch you a couple of clean handkerchiefs, my word, I was relieved to find that you weren't in jail. Many's the fright poor Henry used to give me. I said to myself, Willie wants his sister to look after him, and I came straight here myself and sent the messenger packing. Here's your handkerchiefs. Opening her bag. And, I knew it, you've got a dirty collar on. Producing the handkerchiefs and the clean collar. And, you told me when you got this job that you'd have to have a clean collar every blessed day. Take it off. He meekly does so. 
and allows her to put the clean one on. And I needn't tell you how mighty inconvenient it is me coming here at all. I've left your lunch cooking on the gas stove, and I've been thinking ever since I left that I left the gas turned too high. But if you have a burnt lunch, you'll know it's your own fault. I'll just hurry back. Your hair hasn't been properly brushed. I knew it. Producing his hair brushes from her bag and brushing his hair. And there's a smear of dust on that there mantelpiece. And I bet they never look behind the pictures when they dust. Inches thick. And now, before I fly to that gas stove, it might explode or something. Tell me, Willie, where you were last night. I told you that I was working here late. So late that it must have been two o'clock before I even looked at the time. And as I didn't want to disturb you at that hour, I went to an hotel to sleep. What hotel? The Commonwealth. Oh, well, I must believe you, Willie, and I'm that glad that it wasn't the haunts of wickedness. But you missed a nice hot supper. Turning to go, she sees on the floor the handbag. She picks it up. Willie, what's this? Looks like a lady's handbag, doesn't it? Whose? I haven't the faintest idea. But how did it come here? Left by some visitor here before I came down this morning, I expect. Willie, do you really expect me to believe that? Wait a minute, I'll inquire. Miss Bim. Effie rises. Miss Bim, do you know whose this is? Effie hesitates. Then, seeing the Premier's gaze upon her, makes her effort. M mine, sir. Yours? There you see. But I don't see. Effie, glibly. I dropped it here before you came, sir. Taking it from Martha. Thank you. Very careless of you, Miss Bim. Please don't leave your things in my room again. Oh, no, sir. But it's such an expensive-looking bag. I didn't know that young women... But there, I'm forgetting the gas stove. It'll be red hot and the nice hash burnt to cinders. Martha rushes out. Thank you, Miss Bim. Oh, sir, there's nothing to thank me for. I'd do more than that for... for the premiere. It is a pretty bag, isn't it? I wonder whose. I wonder. Gregory returns. Keep it until the owner claims it. And tell me when she calls. Effie takes it and puts it in the drawer of her desk. There's a reporter from the Tribune, sir. Haven't I told you I won't see the Tribune? That's what I told him, sir. But he sent in a note, personal. Power, taking the note from Gregory, opens it and reads. He is evidently astonished and concerned by its contents. After a pause, rapidly thinking. Bring him in. Gregory opens the door and shows in Charles Lucan, a keen-faced young journalist. Good morning, sir. Oh, it's you, Lucan. I always said you were too smart a journalist to be on that Tory rag. Thank you, sir. I came to see you first thing. The article is ready for publication in tomorrow's issue. You'll see that it will make an immense impression. But it occurred to the editor that possibly you might have an explanation. It seemed only the fair thing to inform you. Power as Effie, who has risen and is about to take her seat to report the interview. No need, Miss Bim. This is private. Effie goes back to her desk. State your business, Lurkin. Last night, or rather this morning, I happened to be passing the house shortly after two o'clock. Two seventeen, to be exact. I looked at my watch. As I was approaching the door that leads to this room from the street, by that door... Indicating the private door. I saw you coming out with a lady, veiled. Go on. There was a cab coming along the street, the only one in sight, worse luck. You hailed it, put the lady in and got in yourself. The cab drove off. Well? That's all. I followed it on foot, but it got away. Well? What I'd seen is enough, for the Tribune's purposes... But the whole staff is on to this story, and we'll have the missing details, the continuation of the story, for tomorrow's issue. You mean to publish this story? What arm will that do me? Surely you can see. The Premier, an unmarried man, is seen leaving the house on a night when Parliament was in sitting, with a veiled woman in the early hours of the morning. Where was she before? In this room. With you. She was? You confess it. Certainly. And you think it worth while to publish this trifling incident? 
Do you think the Tribune could afford to miss a chance like this? When the paper comes out tomorrow, the Premier involved in a scandal with a mysterious lady. <laughs> You'll get plenty of headlines. What chance will you have of winning the by-election? What chance even of retaining your own position? I see. You'll make use of it. We must. A pretty scheme, but you've overlooked something. Surely you know that the publication of that story, even if true, is libel? <laughs> of course it's libel. Well? Do you think the Tribune would stick at a libel action to smash up your party? You mean to tell me that your paper would deliberately lay itself open to enormous damages and the libel action I am bound to bring? Yes. Five thousand pounds would be cheap to us if it were even you. The Liberal Party would willingly put up ten thousand pounds. They can afford it. And will appeal right up to the Privy Council. It'll cost you all that to get a verdict. Oh, <laughs> we'll risk the libel action and you won't survive it. I see. But why'd you come to me? Why do you take the trouble to give away your dirty little scheme? Blackmail? No. The editor thought that you might have some loophole of escape. My story looks damning enough, doesn't it? But for all we know, there might be some easy explanation. We don't mind the libel action, but we don't want to look ridiculous. And you won't print the article if I give you my explanation? It will depend on the explanation. In any case, we are promised to print the explanation with the article. But, if I may suggest, sir, it will have to be a thumping good explanation. Power rises and comes in front of the table. Sir. Restraining himself. But of course, you've only got your facts to go on. I admit they look queer. But when you hear what happened, well, the Tribune tomorrow will be as dull as it invariably is. The facts are these. I came here last night. Yes, it would be about ten o'clock. I found out since that your room was lighted up from ten to twelve minutes past two. I had to finish up a mass of work. I got interested and worked solidly on till I had finished. Then I was astonished to find that it was after two in the morning. I've done that before. I put my papers in order, turned out the light, and was groping my way to that door when I clumsily knocked over this screen. Indicating the big screen behind him. At the same moment, I heard a woman scream. I pushed aside the screen. He does so, revealing a comfortable armchair behind it, under the window at back. And in that armchair I dimly made out the figure of a woman. And how did she happen to be there? That's what I asked her. As soon as she realized where she was, she had been asleep. She slept here, then? Yes, she was sleeping here all the time I was sitting working at this table. I hadn't the least idea. Was she doing it for a wager, or what? She told me that she spent the previous night travelling in the train and hadn't got a wink of sleep. All yesterday she'd been rushing about shopping, and in the afternoon she came to see me on business here. On business? By appointment, I suppose. No, I don't make business appointments with ladies. I wasn't able to go down to my office all the afternoon. As you know, I had two confounded functions to attend. That was why I came back at night to work off arrears. And she waited and waited on the chance of seeing me, and at last, worn out by her lack of sleep, she had quietly dropped off in that big chair. But callers on the Premier aren't usually allowed to fall asleep on his private armchair. How did she get in here? Naturally, I asked her that, as I was taking her downstairs. She said she'd waited in the lobby till late, and then seeing the door of the ante-room open. Dix usually locks it when he's leaving. I must reprimand him. So as there was nobody about then, Gregory must have forgotten all about her. She came into the ante-room. She confessed that she didn't find the chairs for callers there very comfortable. And as she was dreadfully tired, so without any thought that this was my private room, she wandered in here, found that big chair behind the screen, and sat down to wait for me. And after a while she simply dropped off to sleep. 
and she made up for her lost night by sleeping solidly till I knocked over the screen, and I believe that if I hadn't done that, she'd have slept till daylight. That's what she told you? Yes. And you believed her? Naturally. But you don't expect me to believe her? Why shouldn't you? I certainly found her there, and she couldn't have come in while I was in the room, could she? And what did she come to see you for? I didn't ask her. I wasn't going to talk business at that hour. And then? She couldn't stay here. I took her down, got a cab, and... Accompanied her. She insisted on giving me a lift. There was no other cab in sight. And then? I offered to see her to her address, but she wouldn't allow me to trouble. Said she had a latch key. So when I was passing the Commonwealth Hotel, I decided to stay there for the night. I got out and left her in the cab. You see how necessary it is for us to have all the facts for confirmation. I may believe you, but it will be hard to convince our readers. I can trust the Tribune to make it impossible. If you could give me the lady's address, we could have her corroboration. I don't remember. Somewhere in Potts Point, I think. She told me she was staying with friends. I see. You want to shield her. I have told you the simple truth. The whole truth. But do you seriously think, sir, that the public will accept your explanation? Why not? It's true. I shall be delighted to give your explanation in full to our readers. I really think it's more interesting than my story. And you can see what effect your story will have on the by-election and on your own position. The Tribune will force you to resign. I oh, see. He pauses, turning away, reviewing the situation. Then suddenly laughs. Look here, Lucan. I admit I tried to bluff you. I knew it. But what I couldn't make out was why you thought your, uh, explanation would go down with me. I merely tried it on you to save the lady's name. That wouldn't have done you much good. We'll have the lady's name before we go to press tonight. I shall save you the trouble. You'll give me her name? Yes, in confidence. I warn you, sir, that I won't be bound by your confidence if I find her name by other means. I'll take the risk. Her name is Mrs. William Power. Your wife? But you're not married. You mean that nobody knew I was married? The veiled lady was your wife? Is my wife. But what proof have I that this isn't another uh, explanation? No proof at all. But publish your story, and I'll sue you for damages, make the Tribune a laughing stock, and produce my wife. I see. But when were you married? And what was her maiden name? Look here, Lucan. I tried to bluff you, simply because my marriage is a secret one, and I intend to keep it secret. We were married a few days ago, and my wife came to see me secretly last night. Not the first time, either. That's all. You can't use the fact that I'm married. It was told you in confidence. And you won't be able to discover the identity of my wife. But publish your silly story. And my wife will give evidence in the libel action. You've got me. The Tribune wouldn't take the risk. If she is your wife, my story is a mare's nest. But I'll hold it. And if you don't produce your wife, not necessarily in public, but to a representative of the Tribune, we'll go ahead and risk proceedings. I shall introduce you to her. You will? When? In three days. Three days? But by that time the by-election will have been decided. So it will be. It looks like a trick to prevent any disclosure before the election. <sighs> but that doesn't matter. Even if we lose the election, we've got a bigger card up our sleeves. If there is no wife after all, we've still got you. The publication of my story, with as many explanations as you like to supply, will finish you and break up your party. You are at liberty to try. If within three days I do not introduce you to the charming lady, whom I've just had the luck to marry. Perhaps I shall find her first. At least the lady who visited you last night and stayed so late. Exactly. Mrs. William Power.
Exactly. Good morning, and, if I may say so, my congratulations. Thanks. Lucan goes out. Power breathes a sigh of relief. The desk telephone rings. Yes, Pal is speaking. That you, Vice? Yes. Got those reports rewire, Nora? No, don't come up. I'll come to you, straight away. Rings off. To Dix. I'm going to Vice's room. Back in ten minutes. Yes, sir. Power goes out through his private door. Gregory appears, supporting a lady in his arms. She presents the appearance of having just fainted. It's all right, ma'am. More air in here. I'll get you a seat. What's up, Gregory? Lady fainted in the crowded lobby. Quick, put her here. Quite right, Gregory. With Effie's assistance, they place the lady in Dix's chair. She lies limp. Here. Dix gets a glass of water and holds it to the lady's lips. Look, she's drinking it. She'll be all right. The heat in the crowd, I expect. Who is she? The lady who sent in her card. And the premier wouldn't see her. Mrs. Pretty, the owner of Wyanora Estate. Hmm, charming and a widow. No wonder Bill fled. She's the woman who was waiting to see him all yesterday afternoon. I told the premier you can't keep widows out. She is beautiful. And look at that hat. And look at mine. Hush, she's coming too. Helen Pretty revives and sits up. She is all that has been said about her fascination and charm. A smartly dressed woman of twenty-five, obviously accustomed to getting her own delightful way. Usually a smile is sufficient. Oh, what? Did I faint? How stupid of me. Where am I? In the Premier's room, madam. You fainted in the crowded lobby, and Gregory luckily carried you straight in here. There's more air here. Oh, thank you. Thank you all. Brightly, casting off the pretense that had so easily secured her entrance to hidden ground. And now, can I see the Premier? You fainted on purpose. You're merely pretending? The Premier wouldn't see me. What else could I do? Widows. I knew it was no use. But I assure you that the Premier won't see you now. After all the trouble you nice people have taken to bring me here, after I've got so far... Mrs. Pretty, I'm sorry, but the Premier's orders. Uh, he's a man, isn't he? I can deal with men. Rises, and before the others can guess her intention, comes to the Premier's table. She stops, dismayed at seeing he is not present. Why, where is he? Gone out, Mrs. Pretty. I told you he wouldn't. Fled? No, he's hiding. Hiding? Behind that big screen. That's what it's for. Please, Mr. Premier, come out. Puss, puss. Pause. She goes quickly up and peers behind the screen. Oh, not there. Disappointed, she comes back. <sighs> but he was here. I told you he had gone. I'll wait. Moving up to the armchair. This seems the most comfortable chair. The Premier has gone for the day, ma'am. Oh, then I'll just sit down for a few minutes. Oh, I'm feeling faint again. If you'll kindly wait outside. But this chair, it's just the sort of chair I could go to sleep in. These Labour Premiers do do themselves well, don't they? Mrs. Pretty, if you'll kindly wait in that room. Indicating the small door on which Effie's hat is hanging. I'll promise you that I'll call the moment the Premier returns. Then he is going to return. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you so much. Dix, opening the small door. If you please, madam. In here? Oh, what a striking hat. Yours? Suits you admirably, I should say. The paper, ma'am? Voices are heard outside the Premier's private door. There he is. Dix, interposing. He's got someone with him. It's Vice, the party whip. Ah, shoo him off. I must see the Premier alone. I'm sorry, Mrs. Pretty, but you'll have to wait. But you've promised. The minute that Mr. Vice goes, I shall tell Mr. Power. <sighs> oh, well. Glancing at the paper. Why, it must be winter. 
here's david's big winter sale advertised she goes through the door which dix carefully closes behind her lock it and fling the key through the window it's our only chance nonsense gregory i promised besides there isn't a key oh well i washes my hands of you all he goes out power and vice re-enter go on you were working here till after two and then you knocked over the screen and found a woman asleep in the chair some chaps of all the luck but honest now speaking as a man and not as a politician hadn't you any suspicion that she was there how could i so i took her down to the street got a cab and sent her home and the tribune reporter caught you bill a man in your position should have been more careful careful not to be found out but there was nothing to conceal of course if you're going to flaunt your pleasures in the face of the public bill if i'm going to help you out of this mess you'll have to confide in me that's just what i've been doing that's all there is to it honest now you mean to say you don't believe me all i have to say is that if you were caught escorting an unknown woman from your room after two in the morning i should have expected you to have a less preposterous explanation and the tribune will appear with it all tomorrow it won't be published tomorrow so you bluffed lucan after all but how as the truth didn't go i tried the other thing he sits at the table i told him the woman was my wife that's worse than your other explanation everybody knows you haven't got a wife i've got to get one within three days they'll hold the story till then and the by-election will be over by then so if i produce a wife there's nothing in the story worth printing is there excellent and of course after this she'll marry you she must how long has this been going on going on these th the usual word is assignations bit dangerous her coming here though look here vice i never saw her before last night why i don't even know who she is vice with a long look at him bill then it's true you've been telling the truth i beg your pardon old man but you'll confess that the affair is preposterous but surely you know her name no i never really saw her i was with her only a few minutes i turned the light out before i heard her scream and i was too anxious to get her away to light up again and before she left she put down a thick veil why i wouldn't even recognize her if she stalked into this room this minute but the address she gave the cabman somewhere in potts point number number thirty seven yes that's it but i can't recall the street even if i heard it and you told lucan she was your wife and you're going to marry her but how are you going to get hold of her again it's why i've taken you into my confidence can't you suggest something i haven't got much time she must be found isn't there anything about her that you could recognize her from yes i had forgotten miss bim yes sir kindly bring me your handbag effie takes the handbag from the drawer of her desk hands him the bag and returns to her desk does your stenographer usually keep his little mementos for you she found it on the floor this morning the woman must have dropped it last night then she's found she'll have her card or her name inside he opens it and takes out one by one the usual contents of a lady's handbag samples of dress material some silver and coppers a pocket mirror hairpins the inevitable chamois lip salve etc nothing to distinguish her from every woman in the country except the usual sheaf of unpaid dress bills well well how are you going to find her ah oh, she'll come back for her bag i thought of that but perhaps she'll think she left it in the cab or lost it in the street it's our one chance but bill if she does come back why she might be married already i never thought of that but she'll come back there's something here that she'll come back for what's that you i don't follow you she will of course you kissed her last night good god what for a pity i thought every man kissed the women he found in his rooms after midnight they always do on the stage the woman expects it bill 
How careless of you. How criminally careless. It's ruin. And if she comes back and is married, it's ruin. And if she won't have you, it's ruin. You've taken on a good many stiff contracts in your life, Bill, and carried them through. But this? You've got Barclays. Frankly, I see nothing for it but your immediate resignation. I shan't resign. Even if the caucus mind you, it would just be as bad. It would mean the smash-up of the party. Oh, Bill. Damn it, man. Why didn't you kiss her? Vice retires. I'm sorry, sir, but there was a lady fainted in the lobby, and Gregory had to bring her in here. And when she came to, I couldn't turn her out. Where is she? Waiting in my private room, sir. Did she give her a name? Oh, yes, sir. Mrs. Arthur Pretty. Oh, that woman. I won't see her. But she made me promise, sir, that... That's what I pay you for. To break promises when necessary. I won't see her. Helen Pretty appears. Oh, I've read all the advertisements. Haven't you... Sees that Dix is not there. That's all to it. I won't see her or any woman. Oh, yes, Mr. Power. You will. You really can't help it, can you? Dix signals to Effie, who rises, taking her notebook, crosses to her chair, and proceeds to take a shorthand note of the interview. Helen Pretty comes confidently forward to greet Power, but pauses, disconcerted, as she perceives that he does not recognize her. Mrs. Pretty, I believe? Helen, accepting the formal manner. Mr. Power? I have not had the pleasure of meeting you before. We may, I say, unfortunately, belong to different parties. Please sit down. I can give you five minutes. Thanks. Now, what can I do for you? So, this is where you run the country from? No, Mrs. Pretty. This is the office of the servant of the people. The people treat their servant better than I do mine. We are seeing to that. There is a bill being prepared imposing penalties upon employers who do not provide proper accommodation for domestics. It would be more useful if it provided domestics to occupy the proper accommodation. But it was about my estate I wanted to see you. Why, Nora? The biggest estate in the country. Yes? A rumor has reached me that... Noticing Effie reporting the interview. <sighs> is that young lady taking down all I say? Yes, she is reporting the interview. I must have a record. <sighs> But I'm not making speeches. I'm just chatting. To Effie. Would you kindly read a book or pet your nice hair? A premier does not have private conversations. How dull for you. Effie has resumed her reporting. My dear young lady, do you know that your pretty blouse is unbuttoned at the back? Oh, is it? Helen, rising and going to her where she pretends to button up the blouse, which, of course, is already buttoned. Helen, however, contrives to unbutton two buttons. Oh, there. I'm afraid I'm too clumsy. Perhaps the premier? Oh, no. That nice, clean young man would be delighted. Run away and tell him to hurry. Effie, confused, crosses hurriedly to Dix, who fumbles over the job. Now... I heard a rumor that you intended to confiscate my estate. Rumors, madam? May I ask the source of your information? Oh, I don't mind telling you. Mr. Harrington. The leader of the opposition. Yes, he happens to be engaged to me, though you're the first man beside himself to know it. Allow me to congratulate you, Mrs. Pretty. Though, of course, we differ in politics, I have a great respect for Mr. Harrington as a man. Thank you. Then I take it the rumor is true. You mean to confiscate my poor estate? Confiscate? No, we will pay you full value plus ten percent. Oh, but I don't want to sell Wyanora. Madam, Wyanora is a splendid sheep run. But it is empty of men. It lies, vacant, right across the railway line which we built. Since you refused to put that great stretch of fine land to its fullest use, the state must do so. 
the people are crying out for land and you keep that land locked up instead of smiling farms there are only sheep tracks but we get top price for our wool and our men are well paid and happy but what right have you to keep so much land from the people what right have you to take it from me the sacred cause of humanity mrs pretty but it's mine and i love wyanora it's my home the government bill will specifically reserve to you the homestead <sighs> that wouldn't be wyanora effie returns with her blouse buttoned up and resumes her reporting the interests of humanity are greater than the selfish interests of the individual mr power that's all politics and i've no doubt it would sound rather thrilling in a speech but won't you be frank with me you want my land merely for your political purposes you are using it as a bribe to the voters of the electorate so that you can get your men in i suppose your fiance told you that the resumption of your estate and of other big estates will doubtless have that result but the cause of humanity is the force that has led my party to this legislation <sighs> i see you can only talk politics now mr power i want to make a personal appeal not to the premier but to you noticing effie heavens you've got a smut on your dainty nose effie drops her pencil and searches for a handkerchief i cannot allow personal appeals the community demands this bill in the interests of justice the landless men of the state cry out for land as in other countries the poor cry out for bread i would be unworthy of the position i occupy unworthy of my sympathetic instincts if i fell to satisfy that hunger and i cannot make any exceptions the law will make no exceptions your estate is the first to be resumed simply because it is the largest the most acceptable and the most convenient for closer settlement had i owned wyanora i could not have prevented its resumption by the state i regard my estate mr power as a sacred trust handed to me by my late husband he made wyanora he was the pioneer who went out into the desert and fought for a living in the wilderness fought against drought against disease against loneliness and distance and he won but wore out his life in the long battle to effie on the other side of your nose my dear haven't you got a mirror in the room effie rises and crosses to her desk where she gets a hand glass from her desk and examines herself anxiously and now you come along and demolish all that he gave his life to build but if he had lived he would have fought you with what weapons with a man's weapons with your own weapons with politics but i am only a woman so i have to fight you with mine and i have none except my personal appeal to your uh, your chivalry there is no chivalry in politics that went out when women got the vote but you've got your weapon a vote oh, then you won't give way it is not in my power to give way then it is to be war between us as you will then you force me to use my woman's weapon the ballot box <laughs> no effie after scrubbing herself has returned to her seat ah that's better my dear a smut makes a woman's nose look humorous doesn't it and women's noses can't stand looking that can they there wasn't one madam wasn't there oh, i'm so glad i do hope you've got your pencil nicely sharpened i see mr power that you found my bag power springing up in amazement your bag yours i thought i had left it in the cab but i must have dropped it here last night effie sits too interested to take notes you he comes to her 
i should have called this morning anyway to thank you for what you did for me last night or rather this morning my dear mrs pretty i hadn't the least idea it was you but didn't you recognize me again i never saw your face <laughs> you never tried ought i to have no man has ever insulted me so before but i suppose premiers aren't men you and i've been scheming all the morning to discover you again i even looked inside your handbag to find your name and address you opened my handbag oh, i shall never forgive you that's where we women keep our charm our heart and most of our complexion but why this sudden desire to see me again you never expressed the least wish last night why oh just to ask if you'd got home safely and all the while you were waiting outside in the lobby rather lucky i fainted wasn't it incredible luck and fortunate that i left my bag here and not in the cab i've always been lucky he considers my dear mrs pretty perhaps i've been a little hasty in my decision to include your estate on the list of runs to be resumed i'd like say three days to consider the matter you see in judging the suitability of your land for closer settlement i've had to go solely on my agent's reports i've never seen why nora myself then why not inspect it i shall be in the electorate within the next few days perhaps i might take the liberty of calling and having a look at it why not stay with me thank you but mind you i can give no promise if i find wyonora unsuitable of course then you'll come yes not as the premier please as my guest i'm afraid that would be impossible i shall have to bring my secretaries secretaries my good man have you got more than that clean young man over there i've got seven but don't be alarmed if you allow me i shall merely bring one and of course a stenographer oh we've plenty of room there's only a few guests staying now mr harrington of course harrington i was forgetting but since you have just got engaged perhaps i'd better not oh you won't be in the way i'm not a silly sentimental flapper then you'll come delighted when it must be within the next three days i'm going back to-day can you come to-morrow yes i'll motor up that's right well good-bye they shake hands and i must thank you again for your kindness to me last night you'll remember me again won't you it won't be necessary for me to leave my bag again to effie who has been sitting too intent to take a note i hope my dear you got all that down to power till tomorrow then power is showing her out when she turns indicating the private door i think if you don't mind we'll go the same way more private isn't it they go out so it's her the designing creature the cat oh she sweeps across to dick's i can't stay here a moment longer tell mr power i'm ill tell him any lie you like grabs her hat and i thought this hat would do it hat it's not a hat it's a tragedy and hers must have cost a tenner and she wasn't even conscious that she had it on what chance have i jams it viciously on and stabs it with hat pins my heart's broken sneering at me about my blouse one and eleven pence a yard and she knows it said i had a smut on my nose just to let me know the powder had rubbed off oh i'm going out to lunch and i don't care what becomes of me after effie goes tempestuously gregory against whom effie has collided as she went out enters i told you so it all comes of letting that woman in it was you who brought her in and as for miss bim i rather thought she looked quite charming in her temper never guessed she had so much in her and personally i preferred her hat to mrs pretty's you too 
Females. Ugh. Gregory retires. Power re-enters, thoughtfully, moving in front of table and standing, then calling. Dex! Sir? Order my motor to meet me at Woolaroo at 2am. You and Miss Bim come with me to Wyanora. Yes, sir. Ask Vice to see me at once. Dix, going to the telephone on his table. Yes, sir. Vice re-enters. Just ringing for you, Vice. Any clue? A lady herself. Married? Widow. Willing? Possibly. Propose. Tomorrow? Where? Wyanora. Nine? Mrs. Arthur Pretty. Mrs. Pretty? Why? I've just had a ring from my wife to tell me that it is rumoured that Mrs. Pretty is engaged to Harrington, the leader of the opposition. So Mrs. Pretty told me. Well? She asked me to visit Wyanora tomorrow. I'm going to inspect it, whether it is suitable for resumption under the empty estates bill. But you know it is. Of course. That's merely an excuse to see her. All's fair in politics. And you really think... I'll tackled bigger jobs than this and carried them through. But a woman like Mrs. Pretty. Why, she's a society leader, and no fool, and engaged to Mr. Harrington. And is winning a woman much harder than winning a premiership? Ah, I see. You did kiss her last night. No, but I will tomorrow. You're in love with her. In love? God forbid. Don't joke on serious subjects. I've got to marry her, that's all. And in three days. It doesn't leave much time for love making, does it? Even if I knew how. Vice, throwing up his hands. Bill, I often used to wonder whether you were a clever man or merely a fool with luck. I know now. But you'll need all your luck. Vice goes out. Dix! Sir? Ever been married, Dix? No, sir. Pity? How does a man get married in a hurry? Gets a special license, sir, I think. But I fancy the registrar gets you over the mark quicker. Find out the nearest registrar for marriages to Wyanora Homestead. And fix up all the arrangements for me to be married to Mrs. Arthur Pretty within three days. Tomorrow afternoon, if possible. Yes, sir. If it can be arranged, you might leave the lady's name blank. I might change my mind. I see, sir. The essential thing is that you should be married. The particular lady does not matter. Exactly. But I think you can go ahead with the name of Mrs. Pretty. Yes, sir. Gregory returns and crosses to Power, who has resumed his seat behind the table. Those deputations outside, sir. They're getting restive. Power, plunging into work again. Ring them in. Gregory hesitates and returns. Beg pardon, sir, but I hope you'll give me the usual recommendation. Power, busy, not looking up. Why, you're not resigning, Gregory? No, sir. But you are. You think? And who is the recommendation to? The next Premier, Mr. Harrington, sir. Oh, then it will be time to ask for your recommendation in ten years' time. You don't back Harrington against me, I hope. I'm not the referee, sir. Who is? The female, sir. Goodbye, sir. It has been a pleasant connection, but I knew it wouldn't last. The moment I saw that out in the lobby, sir. Rather a smart hat, don't you think, Gregory? Here, run away and bring in that famished deputation. Gregory raises his hands hopelessly and goes out. Power plunges into work again, utterly absorbed. Curtain. End of Act One. Act Two of Mrs. Pretty and the Premier by Arthur Adams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two Scene The living room at Wyanora Homestead is a big room with parquet floor, comfortably furnished with big chairs covered with flowered chintz. No pictures are on the walls, which are devoted to well-filled bookcases. There is a grand piano, tables littered with illustrated papers, magazines, photographs, and vases waiting, empty, for flowers. Tall stand lamps light the room in the evening. At present, however, as it is the bright forenoon of the following day, 
the illumination of the room comes from two big French windows at the back, opening out on a broad veranda, beyond the balustrade of which there is a glimpse of garden and a distant blue range of low hills. There are doors, on the right opening from the hall, and on the left leading to another room. Near at hand, there is a big open fireplace with settees. Mrs. Kuzak, an aristocratic-looking old lady, is sitting, reading an illustrated paper. She yawns, rises, and strolls about the room. Prominent among the many photographs is one of William Power. She takes it up with surprise and scrutinizes it with evident aristocratic disapproval. Helen Pretty, in a charming simple morning dress, enters from the veranda. She is carrying a great bunch of wattle, which she proceeds to arrange in the vacant vases about the room while talking to Mrs. Cusack. <sighs> Lovely, isn't it, Mrs. Cusack? I always say there's no water like the Wyonora water. Helen, noticing the portrait in Mrs. Cusack's hand. Oh, the premiere. I suppose you put it in this prominent position to flatter the inordinate vanity of the great man. Now he's honouring you with a visit. A strong face, don't you think, Mrs. Cusack? I can't imagine, my dear, what you mean by having this man here. I know I shouldn't criticise, but I'm an old woman and an old friend, and I never thought that Wyonora would have a labour agitator for its guest. I always thought him a great, big, hungry ogre, and when I saw him yesterday, I confess he disappointed me. He didn't want to eat me at all though he'd rather like to gobble up my estate. I found him most interesting. So you brought him here to dangle at your skirts, and you just engaged. I may be rude, I have a name for being rude, but what does Mr. Harrington think of this escapade? Mr. Harrington? I mean Vernon. <laughs> you see, I'm so new to being engaged that I haven't accustomed myself to calling him by his Christian name. Vernon hasn't been consulted. I'll tell him when he arrives. He's driving over for lunch. I sometimes think, Helen, that you forget that you're a very pretty woman. <laughs> I hope I shall never forget that. But Mr. Power is safe. He's armoured all over. By his vanity? No, by his bigness. He's a strong man. Hm. By the way, where is the strong man? Helen, indicating the door. In there, working hard. I haven't seen him yet. I heard his motor arrive this morning. A loud, democratic motor that woke me up at a most democratic hour. He motored up in the night. Doesn't he ever sleep? They say the only chance he gets is in the house when he's being attacked by the opposition. He always drops off when Vernon is speaking. But who's he got in there with him? Only his secretary and the typewriter girl. My dear, has he the impudence to bring his harem with him? Harem? Startled, dropping some of the waddle. That girl? Nonsense. He has to travel with his staff. Like royalty. Oh, no. This is practically a private visit. If it was a political one, he'd bring half a dozen secretaries. Then it's merely as your guest that he's here. Oh, I'd like him merely as a guest. But, as it happens, there is a teeny little bit of business mixed up in it. Then it's true that he wants to steal this place from you and give it to the cockies and the unemployed. I'm afraid he still has that idea. Then why... I see. You're going to... Persuade him to let me off. Persuade? How? I'll just be nice to him. How nice? You've reminded me that I'm a pretty woman. Then permit me to remind you that you are engaged to Mr. Harrington. That's why I must hurry. This is my last chance. You're going to flirt with that man? No, I shall play fair. I shall appeal to his common sense. You'd have more chance, Helen, if you'd appeal to his common heart. 
It's to save Wyanora. You may have to pay too big a price. He's not the sort of man you get anything for nothing from. Flirtation is very well, and you do it charmingly. But with one of your own class. Remember, this man does not know the rules. Ah, he's safe. I found that out when I saw him in town yesterday. He's a mere machine, all cogwheels. Oh, a very strong and efficient machine. Why, when I went to see him, he never even noticed my dress or my new hat. He hasn't got a heart. He's got a dynamo. He's just an elemental force, like a thunderstorm. Take care, Helen, that you're not caught in that thunderstorm. Howard's voice is heard, raised threateningly in the next room. Listen, it's growling now. Oh, I can always run to shelter. That's what Vernon is for. But Mr. Power is quite safe. My dear, you seem to have found out a great deal about Mr. Power in your one meeting with him. I saw him twice. I spent most of the night before last in his private office. Helen! <laughs> Quite an adventure, Mrs. Cusack. I called and waited all the afternoon in the lobby to see him, but he never came. Then, as there was nobody about, I went into his room to wait. I was very tired, and you know I had been travelling all the previous night without a wink of sleep. So I plopped into a big, comfortable armchair behind a tall screen. <laughs> These premiers do themselves remarkably well and dropped off and i slept till after two o'clock in the morning uh -huh. and i wouldn't have wakened then if the premier hadn't clumsily knocked over the screen gracious the premier was he there all the time he had been working there since ten o'clock that evening he was almost as much surprised as i was <laughs> it shows anyhow that i don't snore and then Oh, he behaved like a perfect gentleman. No! Took me out and put me in a cab and sent me home. Oh, but did anybody see you? At that hour? Of course not. Thank heaven. But if they had... <laughs> it would have looked rather compromising, wouldn't it? But we could have explained. My dear... It doesn't sound very convincing to me. I don't wonder. The whole thing was too absurd. And Mr. Power, did he... No, he didn't kiss me. Not even in the dark. He didn't even try. And I've been wondering why ever since. Helen! Oh, I wouldn't have let him. But surely any man would have tried. It's hardly a compliment to me, is it? I'm afraid I must be going off. And it would have given just that little emotional touch that the situation lacked. But possibly it never occurred to him. He's not a man. He's a machine. But you'd think that even a machine would sometimes be wound up, wouldn't you? Hmm. Of course it is your duty to tell Mr. Harrington. Helen, moving up to the French window. If Mr. Power had taken advantage of me, I should have felt bound to tell Vernon. But as he didn't, I couldn't possibly tell him. Vernon would think he had. Oh, there he is, coming up the garden. I think you're wise, Helen. Mr. Harrington mightn't believe your absurd story any more than I do. I'll run away and leave you to your fiancé. Oh, don't go. But Mrs. Cusack does. Vernon Harrington enters through the French window. He is a man well-preserved, sleek and well-groomed. His features are carefully masked, a man of passions quelled, but not quenched, and cold of eye. Ah, <sighs> Vernon, you're early. I was impatient to see you again, Helen. She submits to his proprietary kiss. How charming you're looking, dearest holding her face between his hands. There's such a light in your eyes. You are glad to see me. <laughs> of course. Escaping from him. Oh, Vernon, don't. Somebody might see. 
There's nobody here but Mrs. Cusack and the servant, and they don't matter. But I've got another visitor. Indeed. But we don't want anybody else, do we? I should have thought that you'd have kept everybody else away. Who is the intruder? Mr. Power. Not the Premier? Yes. What is he doing here? I asked him up when I saw him in town yesterday. But why? He works so hard, doesn't he? I thought he was looking a little run down. But you don't know him. Why, we got on quite nicely together, and I confess I rather like him. Though to say that one likes a premier is rather like admitting a friendship with an avalanche. He struck me as rather avalanche-y. Helen, do you mean to say that you've invited him up here as your guest? Why shouldn't I? There, silly boy. That wasn't my only reason. I wanted to talk business. Business? Oh, about Wyanora? Yes. Sitting. He seemed to be impressed by my arguments. He decided to come up here and inspect the estate itself, before finally deciding whether it was suitable for closer settlement. And you really think that you can influence Bill Power? My dear Helen, he has made up his mind, and when Bill Power makes up his mind... Yet he accepted my invitation, jumped at it. He's playing with you. I don't know what his game is, but you've laid yourself open to a snub, Helen. I feel hurt, deeply hurt, that you didn't consult me before rushing into this hair-brain scheme. But it only flashed upon me when I saw him in town, and he arrived here at some unearthly hour this morning and had his breakfast in his room and started making speeches to his typewriter girl immediately after, shut up in that room. I haven't even seen him yet. You haven't seen him? Good. What do you mean? I'll see him. But Vernon, I asked him up here to see me. He is your guest, of course. But in a business matter such as this, I am your representative. Ah, oh, but you'd spoil it all. It would be merely a political conference. But surely I... Vernon, dear, when I accepted you, I didn't accept a business representative. I feel quite capable of managing this affair myself. How? You think you could convince power where I have failed? You've only used arguments. They never convince anybody, not even politicians. And what will you use? My eyes. You're going to... Exactly. It's the only way. If it's possible to flirt with a block of granite, I'm going to flirt with Mr. Power. But no decent woman would use those weapons. They're the only weapons nature has provided us with. But that is a dangerous game for a woman to play. It's the only game you let us women play. And all's fair in love and politics. And this is which? Ah, uh, I can't tell yet. Probably a teaspoonful of each. I'm afraid, Helen, I must forbid this mad scheme. Helen, quickly jumping up. Uh, forbid? I cannot allow my future wife to bring herself in contact with that man. Can't allow? Vernon, you adopt that tone to me? Vernon, seeing he has gone too far. I beg your pardon. Helen, carrying it off with a smile. Oh, you big stupid. Do you know what's the matter with you? With me? You're jealous. Yes actually jealous. You think I'm in love with Mr. Power. In love? With him? Nonsense. You're engaged to me, aren't you? But the ludicrous possibility has just occurred to me that Power is in love with you. Ludicrous? Why shouldn't a nice, clean man fall in love with me? You did yourself. Do you really think so? Wouldn't that be exciting? But no, it's impossible. Why, Mr. Power never even offered to... To what? Um... 
Bertrand to compliment me on my new hat. He never even noticed that I had a hat on. You wanted him to? Any woman would. That's why we wear hats. Goodness knows they aren't of any other use. There. You see, he is not a man. Now just leave this little worrying business in my hands. But I'm just looking forward to it. Then, Helen, I can only say... Helen, putting her hand to his mouth. Shh, shh, shh. Don't say it, please. Why, why, it's almost a quarrel. Our first quarrel. And we're just engaged. Dear, let us kiss and be friends. Mm, there. When we're married, I'll be a good, meek little girl and do as I'm told. But... Charles Lucan is shown in by a maid. Mr. Lucan, Mum, to see Mr. Harrington. Ah, Lucan, you wanted to see me. On urgent business, sir. Helen, this is Mr. Lucan, the representative of the Tribune. Mrs. Pretty. How are you? I suppose it's politics. I'll run away. But I expect you to stay to lunch, Mr. Lucan. Thank you, Mrs. Pretty. Helen goes out. What's the matter, Lucan? The Tribune has got hold of some important private information, something we can't publish yet, but something the editor thinks you should know. Damaging to the Labour crowd? Immensely. Go on. Power's voice is heard, a great roar of laughter in the room outside. Lucan, startled. What's that? It can't be. Yes, it's the Premier. Here? In the enemy camp, he's here on business, inspecting the estate. Lucan, lowering his voice, with a look at the door. What I have to tell you, Mr. Harrington, concerns the Premier, personally. I shouldn't like him to catch me here with you, sir. I see. Come into the garden. He leads the way, and together they exit through the French window and disappear, talking, into the garden. William Power enters, followed by Dix. Well, that's finished. There's nothing else important, is there? Dix, with open notebook, reading. Um... Run over the list. Those appointments to that Royal Commission, sir. Postpone them. The Secretaries of State Urgent Cable. Keep the Secretary of State waiting. Does these English Johnnies good. Keeps them awake. Inspect Wyonora. Did that in the motor last night? See, Mrs. Pretty. Ah, I knew there was something I'd forgotten. Important, too. Dix, make that the first order of the day. Shall I tell her that you wish to see her, sir? Yes. No! I don't know how to begin. I must work up my speech. Speech, sir? I'm going to propose to her. You don't imagine I can marry her without proposing. Draft me a proposal. To a widow. Love. Respect, devotion to the public, uh, I mean, devotion to the widow, you know the sort of thing. I'm afraid, sir, I couldn't draft that sort of speech. Why aren't you my private secretary? What do I keep you for? Haven't you ever proposed to a widow? Can't you draft a simple proposal? Not a proposal of marriage, sir. Power, vexed at a loss, then calls. Ah, Miss Bim! Effie Bim enters. Miss Bim, you've been in love? Dozens of times, sir. Any proposals? Fifteen. Good. Just jot me down a pricey of the points made by your fifteen admirers when proposing. The points that specially appealed to you. I'm afraid, sir, what most appealed to me could not be expressed in words. In fact, it wasn't words. But no, sir... The subject is too sacred. I rejected them all, except the last one, and I haven't made up my mind about him unless he's more definite. And the whole fourteen went on something awful. Threatened never to kiss me again. Quite right, Miss Bim. I respect your womanly instincts. But you could tell me how they began. The opening address, eh? How did they lead up? Most of them just kissed me, sir. It seemed to give them confidence. But I couldn't possibly start like that. It's always done, sir. And a shoulder to lean on makes it so much more comfortable for the lady. 
In the last case, Mr. Dix... Dix makes a hopeless gesture. Dix? Yes, in the motor last night. But I was in the motor last night. Well, you were asleep. Well? Sir, I must protest. Such moments are sacred. I can't allow that, Dix. The personal feelings of individuals must not be considered when public affairs are at stake. To Effie. How did he begin? I know how he would have liked to begin, but you were lying between us, sir, with your feet up. He squeezed my hand. Power, making a mental note. Squeeze her hand. But he had a reach over my feet, eh? Oh, no, my hand happened to be over his side. Then he whispered, Ducky. Ducky? Ducky Dumpkins, I think it was. No, that was Charlie the 13th. Dumpkins? And he said he worshipped the very typewriter my pretty fingers played on. But Mrs. Pretty doesn't play on a typewriter. Mrs. Pretty? He wasn't proposing to her. I'd just like to catch him. If I thought he meant to, I believe I'd accept him. Calm yourself, Miss Bim. What did he say next? I couldn't hear. You snored. And then? That was all. It was the most unsatisfactory proposal I've ever had. Like tea without sugar. And in your opinion, as an experienced woman, fifteen, wasn't it? Was that an attractive proposal? Did your heart thrill to his impassioned words? Fat lot of good if it had. We were separated by your feet. We were worlds away. Besides, I love another. Dix, who has stood on tenterhooks listening, turning away with a sigh of relief and moving up to the French window. Ah. And hasn't this other proposed? Not yet, sir. He doesn't know. He is blind. Blind. I did have hopes yesterday, but now... Now... Now I know he loves another, and oh, Mr. Power, my heart is breaking, and I do so need a nice, cozy, manly shoulder to weep upon. She throws herself into Power's arms. Helen Pretty inopportunely returns. Oh, good morning, Mr. Power. Noticing Effie. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were busy. I'll go. No. Dix, remove this moist young woman. Dix removes her limp and sobbing form. Better mop her up. Take her into the garden and let her dry in the sun. Certainly, sir. To Effie. There, ducky. Come out into the garden and have a real good cry. I don't mind my suit. <laughs> anyway, I did weep in his arms. And that's more than any other woman has been able to say. Effie goes out triumphantly, supported by Dix. I feel I am keeping you from your work, Mr. Power. I never knew before a premiere had so much to do. But, Mrs. Pretty, I particularly wished to talk to you. Helen, looking out at the garden. No, that's too bad. I thought those poor things had the garden to themselves. They need it, don't they? And there's Mr. Harrington and that reporter man there, too. A reporter? Why, that's Lucan of the Tribune. Yes, he said he had some important news for Mr. Harrington. I left him here. Politics, I suppose. That's the only thing you men think important. But it does seem important, doesn't it? Look at Mr. Harrington. I've never seen him so excited. Not even when he... Power, returning. Lucan up here. And confiding in Harrington. I've no time to lose. He's told him. Told him what? Something, Mrs. Pretty, that makes it imperative for me to speak. About my poor estate. You've decided. No, it's not about why, Nora, but a much more serious subject. It's about... Uh, a woman. A woman? The woman I've decided to marry. Oh, that pretty little typewriter girl you carry around with you? Who wept so picturesquely on your shoulder? Well, why don't you? Anybody can see she's in love with you. Miss Bim in love with me? Head over her pretty Cuban heels. But I'm old enough to be a father. So was my poor husband. But the modern girl doesn't want a mere husband. 
she likes someone who has sufficient experience to settle down to remain a husband even the flapper distrusts any hair that isn't slightly grey but what could miss bim find the love in me perhaps it was your shoulder it looks such a comfortable shoulder to weep upon she never gave me the least cause to suspect <laughs> on the two occasions i've seen you together she's done nothing all the time but tell you she never said a word i heard her quite distinctly every look she gave you shouted it but men are so deaf why for all you know i might be in love with you you oh i can understand that little girl's infatuation you're so big and burly and stupid mrs pretty you make it easier for me would you kindly sit down helen amused sitting thank you power drawing himself up as if about to make a speech to his constituents there comes a time ladies uh, i mean mrs pretty when uh, the exigencies of uh, life insist upon that which ah no what i was about to observe mr chairman ladies and gentlemen is that a premier is after all a servant of the people his life private as well as public should be in accordance with the social and democratic life of this favoured community he should march shoulder to shoulder with the that that is to say with the husband he should <laughs> why you're making a political speech to poor me am i well you see they're the only sort of speeches i can make do you know they rather bore me do they ah uh, mrs pretty has it ever occurred to you that beneath this devotion of mine to the public welfare this sacrifice of my life to the incessant demands of the progressive amelioration of humanity there might be he suddenly drops his laboured speech and becomes natural ah, damn it mrs pretty will you marry me marry you but you dear foolish man don't you know i'm engaged to marry mr harrington i didn't ask you if you were engaged i asked you to marry me mr power if this is a joke i consider it in excessively bad taste a joke i was never more serious in my life <laughs> but the thing is absurd you a marrying man there's no law against getting married is there yes one well tell me and i'll rush through a bill to amend it not even a registrar can marry a man who hasn't got the lady's consent you mean that you don't uh, love me love you mr power and i just engaged to mr harrington i haven't begun even to analyze my sentiments toward you we've practically just met if you want me to humour you in this farce i'll admit that i find you an interesting type as long as you don't make speeches at me or ask me to marry you and i confess that i admire you well but even if i did love you which of course i don't it is usual for the gentleman to be in love with the lady haven't i asked you to marry me anybody could do that but he ought to have some excuse love is the usual one love i've had no time for love mrs pretty in my life there's been no room for women i've had a life of ceaseless struggle i ran away from home to the gold diggings when i was only a kid i worked i never found any gold but there are plenty of opportunities for a willing chap on the diggings before i was sixteen i was getting the man's wages and earning em i saved my money i never drank and the women i was thrown into contact with had no attractions for me 
Well, I got on. At last the chance came to start a store in a new rush. Luck was with me. Luck has always been with me. That rush became a mining township, and as it grew, my business grew. There were big profits to be made in those days. Honest profits, too. And when civilization came along, it found me a rough, uncouth, uneducated young man, prosperous in a small way, but nothing but a country storekeeper. But even then there was in me a vague and vast ambition. I had sense enough to see what was wanting in me, and set to work to implant it. I began to educate myself, and you don't know how far down I had to start. I could not speak without dropping my H's. I could not write a single letter. But I said to myself that if I could make money, I could make myself. And all that time, do you think I could spare a moment for women and love? What was there in this ignorant, rough young man for any woman to love? But at twenty-six I found the ladder by which I was to climb. And when I was elected a member of Parliament for that rough mining constituency, not because I could make speeches, but because the miners trusted me, and I had grown up among their ideals, then I had sense enough to tell myself that, so far, I was only on the lowest rung of the ladder. I entered Parliament, a rough mining member, knowing the needs of my community, but unable to express them. I was laughed at by the Tony members who had been to the universities, I became the butt of the whole house. Time or inclination, then, to fall in love? I saw that I hadn't begun my schooling. I went to a tutor, and learned grammar, and arithmetic, and history. I found out the uses of libraries. So I slogged in, making myself over, night after night, and in between I made more money. And gradually the house learnt that I was something better than a laughing stock. They found I could hit back, and hit hard. They began to see that behind my crudities I meant something and meant to get somewhere. And my constituency believed in me and returned me again and again. And all the time the greater constituency of Labour was growing, and it too believed in me. So in the ranks of labour and in the ranks of the house, I gradually forced myself forward, helped by nothing but my personality, driven on solely by my convictions and my curbed and secret ambition. No one but myself dreamed that the day was so near when labour would rule the land. Time for women then, time for sentiment, and then the moment I had worked for came and lifted me into the premiership. Time to relax then, time to become acquainted with a sex I had so long ignored, time to learn to love. More work crowded in on me, forced me back to the desk, chained me night and day. Time for women then, time even to understand them, time for love. No. Helen, who has listened with growing interest. I understand, and I sympathize. I guessed something of this, else I would not have forgiven you for asking me to marry you when you knew I was engaged. But even if I weren't sufficiently a woman to want to be wooed, I must tell you that, though you have been able to bludgeon your way to the premiership, you can't bludgeon your way into marriage. I am afraid, after all, that you are only fit to be a premier. Power Formally. Mrs. Pretty, I ask you for your hand. Helen, rising and giving him her hand. My hand? <laughs> Certainly. You may hold it, without prejudice, for two minutes. But remember, there's a ring already on it. Yes, you can squeeze it if you like. He does so, making her wince. Thanks. But on one condition. Power, suddenly cautious. Conditions, eh? Yes, that you give up your mean scheme to take Wyanora away from me. Power, dropping her hand. Mrs. Pretty, you're talking business. Why, weren't you? 
Power, after a pause. And it's no use? Then I had better go. Oh, you were really in earnest? You really thought that I, an engaged woman, would seriously consider a proposal from you? You actually took it for granted that I would listen to you? Well, you did. Do you know why? No. Perhaps it was merely a woman's curiosity, but no. It was because I felt a certain sympathy with you. I was grateful for what you did for me the night before last. But I didn't do anything. That's why. A man less honorable would have. Done what? Taken advantage of the extremely compromising position in which I had placed myself. To attempt to kiss me. To kiss you, Mrs. Pretty? Never occurred to me. There. And it didn't occur to you to disbelieve my story. It never struck you that I, an unknown woman, might have taken that means to force myself upon you. After all, my story didn't sound very believable, even to myself. Surely it wasn't all a trick. No, it couldn't be. Of course not. But you accepted my bare word, the word of a stranger and a woman. You did not even attempt to see my face, nor ask my name. I was grateful for that. So, when you asked me to marry you, I didn't get up and go. Miss Bim was right. She said her proposals, and she'd had fifteen, always started with a kiss. Curious. Most, no, all of my proposals started the same way. When you've got over this disappointment, if it is a disappointment, and you see some nice woman brought up to be a premier's wife, you might remember Miss Bim's advice. I see. I should have started by kissing you. Not at all. Perhaps you should have attempted to. But if I'd attempted to, I should have kissed you. Helen, taken aback. Oh, I believe you would. Well, no harm's done. And now I want your forgiveness. For what? For deliberately leading you on. Leading me on? I assure you, I never noticed it. Oh, you wouldn't. But I confess, I attempted to flirt with you. I took advantage of your feeling for me to try and induce you to give up your scheme for resuming Wyanora. <sighs> but it didn't work. You didn't know how to flirt. I see. You wanted to get something out of me. That's why you came to see me. That's why you were nice to me. That's why you invited me up here. My dear Mrs. Pretty, don't let that distress you. I'm accustomed to that sort of thing. Since I've been Premier, I've come to the conclusion that there isn't a single disinterested man in the world. Now I see I must include women. But I should have liked to think that you... Oh, but I do. Lots and lots. Thank you. I believe you. Well, as you said, no arms done. Let's shake hands. You forgive me? Giving her hand. Thank you. Really, I think you're rather a dear. Power takes her hand, looking into her face. She uneasily drops her eyes. Impulsively, he puts his arm round her and is on the point of embracing her. Vernon Harrington appears at the French window. Vernon pauses a moment in amazement, then strides forward, his arm raised. You! Power, swinging Helen aside protectively. Harrington! Vernon! Why didn't you come sooner? Vernon, with a sneer, white with passion. Or later? Mrs. Pretty is not to blame. She gave me not the least excuse nor encouragement. I apologize for my mad impulse. And now, if you'll allow me, I'll go. Not yet. Helen, I've just heard something that you'll be interested to hear. From Lucan? 
Yes, and since Mrs. Pretty is your host, it is her duty to know. It can't matter now. Tell her. He turns, about to go. No, you wait in here. As you please. Vernon, I don't want to hear. You must. That man whom you invited here as your guest was involved only the night before last in a painful scandal of the grossest kind. The night before last? Yes, though he bluffed Lucan from publishing the damning facts for a few days, Lucan felt it his duty to inform me as leader of the opposition. He told you in confidence, didn't he? Yes, but this is a matter that concerns you in your capacity of guest at Wyanor. Your hostess has a right to know the whole story. Oh, but I'd be delighted to hear the dreadful thing that Mr. Power did the night before last. I think not. One minute. Lucan. Lucan enters. Lucan, kindly repeat to Mrs. Pretty the statement you have just made to me. I hardly like... You see, it, it wasn't confidence. Go ahead, Lucan. It's simply this. I happened to catch Mr. Powett coming from his private room in the house in the early hours of yesterday morning with a woman. What sort of woman? What sort of woman would be coming from the man's rooms at that hour? It might be his sister, mightn't it? Or a charwoman? I admit the facts, but I have already explained them. Oh, your explanation. What was it? He said he didn't even know the lady's name. He had found her asleep behind a big screen. <laughs> it doesn't seem very likely, does it? Though there is a big screen in Mr. Power's room. I saw it myself. Oh, there's another explanation even more preposterous. Luke, and you promised to withhold publication of your story for three days, on condition that I produce the woman. And you won't. I find I am unable to do so. You can publish the whole thing tomorrow. Really? Thank you, sir. I had better send a wire to the office at once. Surely there's no hurry, Mr. Lukin. I had expected you to stay to lunch. No, uh, there's no hurry. The whole story, explanations and all is set up, but it can't appear before the first edition tomorrow morning. All I have to do is to wire them it is okay, and by this time the Tribune will probably have the woman's name and her statement. <laughs> You'd never think it from the Tribune's editorials that it was so clever, would you? Then you'll stay to lunch. Any time this afternoon will do for my wire. Thank you, Mrs. Pretty. I'll wait in the garden. Lucan goes out. I think I have shown you, Helen, that Mr. Power is fitted neither to be a premier nor your guest. I do not intend to trespass further on Mrs. Pretty's hospitality. No, Mr. Power. I couldn't think of letting you go without your lunch. I insist on your staying. Thank you. And now as I've got some work to do, one moment, please. Power pauses. To Vernon. And what do you propose to do now? I must wait till tomorrow, then I'll expose him. But the Tribune will have done that. Not as well as I shall. If you like, you can make it public today. Today? I am addressing a big meeting at three. Then, I suppose, you'll tell your meeting this savoury story. Yes. And it will win you the by-election. There can be no doubt about that. But the woman? What about the woman? You'll expose her, too? Oh, she must take the consequences. But you don't know whom she is. Not yet, but I can trust the Tribune to unearth her. And you hope they'll find her, so that you can crucify her for your politics and kill her reputation. What's the reputation of one woman when so much is at stake? No matter who she is? No matter who she is. Even if she is innocent? Innocent? That woman? 
that woman is no no yes to vernon that woman is me no impossible you yes it was me i i went to sleep behind the screen vernon with a savage snarl that story you expect me to believe that oh of course you'll back your partner up it's the only thing left for you to do it's a pity you didn't decide between you on a better story you you don't believe me believe you i believe you spent the evening in that man's room but asleep behind the screen nobody would believe you nobody not even the man i am engaged to marry him least of all oh vernon you i find you here in that man's arms and you think i'm fool enough to believe it was for the first time Arrington, take that back take it back or all oh i believe you politely sneering i believe you both your explanation is so satisfactory that that I have no further doubts. Vernon! I'm afraid that I can't stay to lunch, Mrs. Pretty. Vernon, you can't mean... Mrs. Pretty, I must say goodbye. Not goodbye. Goodbye. Vernon, without any further leave-taking, goes out. Helen stands thunderstruck, staring after him. The realization of her dismissal slowly dawns on her. She glances down at her right hand and stares at her engagement ring. Slowly she draws it off and drops it mechanically into a bowl of wattle with a long sigh. Then she contemplates her finger again, miserably. Power stands waiting, staring straight out, not seeing her. Helen, after a long look at him, shrugs her shoulders and moves toward him. <sighs> Mr. Power... You don't love me. No. But you asked me to marry you. Why? It was forced on me. Forced on you? Luke and Sora's coming from my room. He threatened to print the story and the damning interpretation he put on it. He refused to believe my plain statement. So, to prevent him, I told him that the woman was my wife. Your wife? Don't you see a man's wife would be the only woman whose presence at that hour could give rise to no scandal? But then you told him that you didn't even know who I was. No, it was pure bluff. At least it would have given me three days. I got him to withhold publication for three days with the promise that I would produce the woman, my wife, within that time. Ah, oh, I see. You did it to shield me. To save that unknown woman's reputation. Mr. Power, that is a thing for which every woman would honor you. And I, I thank you. No, I am not that sort of man. I never gave a thought to you. Oh. You have been frank with me, and all the time I have not been frank with you. I decided to marry that unknown woman. To save her reputation. No to save my own your reputation <sighs> but a man's reputation doesn't matter in affairs of this sort a man's doesn't but a premier's does i had to gain time to delay the publication of that libel to the by-election was won i thought i could find the woman and marry her you see i knew nothing of women and now the story will be published tomorrow and we'll lose the by-election and of course, when this comes out, I shall have to resign the premiership. Resign? Step down after you have climbed so high. I couldn't keep a party behind me with the reputation I shall have tomorrow. That means that the government will be defeated and... and Mr. Harrington... He'll make an excellent premier. So you did it all in a desperate effort to save yourself. And my party? Oh, you are your party. Then it was all selfish. This world, Mrs. Pretty, is mostly for itself, and I am merely a politician, no hero. And so, having shown you what I am, 
I can only apologise for my mad intrusion into your life and go. <laughs> That's so like a man. Selfish, yes, because you're a man. And like a man, you have never thought of me. You? Yes. Have you forgotten the shameful scene you witnessed just now? You saw Mr. Harrington break off his engagement with me. You saw him wound and scorn me. You saw him utterly shame me. Coming impulsively to him. I shall not lift up my beaten head again unless... Unless what? Unless you marry me. Marry you? But you've already refused me. Helen, with an almost hysterical laugh. <laughs> you should always ask a woman twice. You forget that when I was bound, I was engaged to Mr. Harrington. You saw what came of that. Well, I'm a free woman again. A bitterly shaken woman. A humble woman. So, Mr. Power, there is no obstacle in your way if... If you'll only ask me again. No, I could not do that. You mean to sacrifice yourself for me. I thank you for it, but I could not so ruin your life. But it is not myself I am sacrificing. It is you I ask to make the sacrifice. Desperately. Mr. Power, I ask you to marry me. You mean it? But why? Why? Oh, don't ask why. Don't ask anything. Just, just take me in your big strong arms and, and comfort a little child that's got the miserables. <laughs> you poor little baby, yes. He takes her gently in his arms. Though she expects it, he does not kiss her. I see. We too? That's the only thing left for us to do. Helen, through her tears. <laughs> there, I feel better already. <sighs> what a comfortable shoulder you've got. And I'm sure it isn't padded. Bill! Yes, Mrs. Pretty? The man I'm engaged to usually call me Helen. Well, Helen? Bill, I've got an idea. I think being engaged rather stimulates the brain, don't you? Bill, marry me today, please. So do I. This afternoon, don't you see? Being engaged doesn't seem to stimulate you. You promise to produce your wife within three days. Well, produce her now. Power, suddenly alert. Um, dish Harrington in the Tribune after all. No, don't move. Stay where you are. You might get some more ideas. I see if we're married this afternoon, then Harrington can't say a word at this meeting tonight, and the poor old Tribune can't print a line. That's why. But, Bill, dear, could we be married in such a hurry? I arranged all that yesterday, the moment you had left. Helen, releasing herself. Arranged it? Oh, Dick's fixed it up with the nearest registrar, just in case you accepted me, you know. Oh, you do rush things, Bill. But I like you for it. So you knew all along I'd have you. I was as sure you'd marry me yesterday, as I was sure you wouldn't ten minutes ago. I might change my mind again. That's why I suggested us getting married this afternoon. Come, I must introduce you to Lucan. Oh, but Mr. Lucan knows me. Only one of you. I want to introduce him to two other people. The mysterious woman and my wife. Hmm, he's out in the garden. He couldn't possibly see us here. Power, unconscious of her wish to be kissed. That's why we must go to him. They go out into the garden. Mrs. Kuzak enters. She is surprised to find the room deserted. She goes up to the French windows and looks out. Helen on the Premier's arm, and Harrington driving away like a man possessed. 
Through the other French window to that at which Mrs. Cusack stands, Dix and Effie Bim enter, hand in hand. Another pair. She goes. It's a lovely garden, isn't it? I'd like a garden like that for our house, Herbert. But I think Bill might have had the decency to leave the garden to us. Do you know, Herbert, there was a time when I was just a teeny bit attracted by Mr. Power. Him? Why, he must be forty. And fancy him being caught so easily by that designing creature, Mrs. Pretty. I can't for the life of me see what he can see in her. Why, she must be nearly thirty. And a widow. Here they come. Quick, come into this room. I haven't kissed you on the left ear yet. Then I can't understand how you managed to miss it. They fly. Power and Helen re-enter. <laughs> Wasn't he surprised and disappointed? Never even congratulated us. Do you know, Bill, you've got a duck of a chin? Have I? But if we're going to be married this afternoon, I must finish up my work. Work? Now? Oh, there's always work for a premier. But we're just engaged, Bill. That's what's wasted the time. All the preliminaries. I'll be finished in time for lunch. He goes into the other room. <sighs> I thought I was getting a husband. And all I've got is a premier. Mrs. Kuzak returns. Well, Helen, can you explain what happened? I've broken off my engagement with Mr. Harrington, and I'm going to marry Mr. Power this afternoon. Helen, was it necessary for you to go to such lengths merely to prevent Wyonora being taken from you? Wyonora? Why, I've forgotten all about Wyonora. Then... Hasn't Mr. Power promised not to steal it? Oh, I clean forgot to ask him. Then why... Why are you going to marry the Premier? The usual reason, Mrs. Cusack. Because I love him. I fell in love with him at first sight, behind the screen, at two o'clock in the morning. But how did you know? How do I know? My dear Mrs. Cusack, I'm a widow, and I'm head over heels in love with the great, big, burly, silly baby. A gong sounds. That's lunch. Helen, running toward the door. Bill, dear. Bill. Billykins. The gong's gone for the wedding breakfast. Curtain. End of Act Two. Act Three of Mrs. Pretty and the Premier by Arthur Adams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three Scene The same as in Act One. The time is midnight, a few days later. The House of Parliament is in session. William Power is seen at his table, busily working, clearing out pigeonholes and drawers, filing and destroying documents. His manner is grave and preoccupied. Vice, shown in by Gregory, enters. Well? It's all up, Bill. We're still one vote short. Just the one vote we need to make it a tie, and enable us to carry on till our absentee members can get back. Wouldn't Thompson rat? I thought we could nobble him, but... Wasn't our price high enough? Nothing we could offer would be high enough. He can't be bribed for his vote. He's been bribed already. Harrington has offered him a place in his cabinet. I might have thought of that. It's just what I would have done myself, when so much depended on one vote. The rotten luck of it all. Here we've got a working majority. An actual working majority. And Whittaker gets suddenly ill and McCallum's in New Zealand, and Harrington won't allow him a pair, and we get our man in at Wyanora by election. And the writ's not return, and he can't take his seat till Wednesday. And down on us swoops Harrington with a censure motion. Of course it's a snap division, but it's a censure motion, and the governor must send for Harrington. 
then he forms a ministry and goes straight to the country as premier and you know what that means it's the dead finish bell oh we'll get our innings again some day but to be snuffed out like this after all i did my sacrifice was useless your sacrifice oh i see you mean your marriage with mrs pretty all that bother and all useless you're the first husband i've met who regarded his honeymoon as a sacrifice my honeymoon there hasn't been a honeymoon no honeymoon no marriage but you told me you married her legally yes but immediately after the ceremony i got wind of harrington's motion of censure and i motored straight down here but mrs power mrs power oh you mean the lady i married i left her at wire nora as a married man bill i think you made a mistake women don't easily forgive a thing like that oh, i can't consider her feelings in a crisis like this and after the division tonight i'll have plenty of time for this honeymoon foolery you'll be a free man tomorrow no i mean today it's a quarter to one go back to wynora first thing and make it up but i can't understand harrington making this compulsory resumption of empty estates bill the ground of his censure motion why not it's the only subject on which his party is unanimous i grant you it was good political tactics on harrington's part but surely you forget that mrs pretty's estate i mean your wife's estate is the first area to be resumed under your bill well because i married her is that any reason why i should go back on my policy i see she'll let you have your way i haven't discussed it with her you haven't spoken to her about it the subject wasn't mentioned no time she'd have been dreadfully disappointed if you'd passed your bill well thanks to harrington it won't be passed thanks to harrington i say bill has it occurred to you that she might have put harrington up to this motion of censure what for to save her estate you won't help her why shouldn't she turn to the one man who cares i don't know much about women but i admit it seems rather likely thinking it over yes why shouldn't she so i owe this to my wife grimly and you ask me to go straight to her now i don't say she's done it but you see she turned harrington down and he's not the sort of man to give up i often suspected that harrington's passion swayed him more than he let us see he's still in love with your wife and here's his chance to show her he can serve her and humiliate you he might be working for more than the premiership he may want your wife if she's been at the bottom of it he's welcome to her the talking won't do any good it's no use keeping the debate going any longer is it let's get back to the chamber and take the division as soon as wells has finished his speech might as well get it over it's nearly one o'clock and i'd like a sleep well good-bye bill when we come back to this room again you won't be premier good-bye old chap it's all the luck of the game power and vice go out a knock is heard at the door gregory is surprised he opens the door helen power enters she is in evening dress gregory where's the premier i'm not very sure ma'am who is the premier just now but mr power is engaged in the chamber if you'd wait till after the division the vote hasn't been taken yet not yet ma'am but are you sure you wouldn't know here what's going on in the house i'd know by the division bell ma'am uh, what's a division bell gregory indicating the division bell over the door that ma'am when a vote is being taken the bells ring all over the house to call the members in to record their votes but what does mr power want with one in here for wouldn't he hear the other bells ringing not in this private room ma'am it's soundproof with double doors 
the cabinet meetings are held here and it wouldn't do for anybody to overhear all the devilry that goes on now would it i see please tell mr power that i'm here his wife yes ma'am gregory goes helen left alone examines the room her attention is specially drawn to the division bell she examines it carefully then comes down oh if there was some way that i could help gregory returns showing in power and retires you i thought you were at wyanora at home when you were fighting for your life you thought that i could stay sitting quietly there with my useless hands in my lap with not even a telegram from you to tell me how the battle was going bill your wife is not that sort of wife but quick tell me what chance have you of winning none he's caught us on the hop with one of my party away ill another away in new zealand and the writ for the by-election not returned so that brown can't vote sir harrington's party will just win by one vote only one vote oh it's enough you ought to be satisfied with your work my work what have i done oh if only i could do something surely you've done enough i don't understand how could i let me remind you i was called away down here immediately after my our marriage i don't blame you for being angry at my desertion but that you should seek to revenge yourself in this way and by that man bill what on earth are you talking about i'll be plain enough you're angry because i left you you knew that i was committed to the passing of the bill that would take y and nora from you so you turned to the one man who could prevent that bill passing <sighs> you think that i got mr harrington to move this vote of censure oh but you can't think that of me that i plotted your defeat and with that man why i hate him that would not prevent you using him would it but what grounds what evidence have you got to show i could do this thing oh you're clever enough to hide your tracks but i haven't seen mr harrington i haven't written to him your very presence here at this hour confirms me you came down to share in harrington's triumph i came down because i was torn with anxiety about about your estate no about my husband because i had hoped that in some way i could help you help me a woman your wife it's too late now either to help or hinder that bell will ring at any moment i suppose you'd like to come into the ladies gallery to see my defeat no i'm too upset too hurt too miserable to see anybody couldn't i wait here very well but you'll come straight back after i hear the bell and tell me the result won't you yes but there can only be one result bill you've made me your wife and i am almost happy because you will see how silly your suspicions are and bill i almost hope for your defeat i knew it because in your downfall perhaps perhaps you'll feel the need of me i shall wait here and if it is not premier who comes back to me it will be somebody i love infinitely better my husband power arrested by her sincerity helen it was vice who put those ideas into my mind convince me gregory enters with a note which he hands to power i am wanted at once in the house wait here he goes out oh to think that he should believe that i and mr harrington suddenly arrested by a new thought mr harrington vernon why shouldn't i try pulling herself together as she sees gregory waiting gregory yes mrs power my husband tells me that the opposition will beat him by just one vote 
One vote will be enough. But isn't there any chance that one vote could be won over from the other side? Do you think, ma'am, that that hasn't been tried? That's the first lesson of practical politics. But couldn't one of the opposition be prevented from voting? How? I think if I were Premier, I'd strangle him. That's just what Mr. Power would love to do. Especially if it was Mr. Harrington. But it's rather risky, even for a Premier. But there must be other ways. I wish we knew them, ma'am. It would save the country all the expense of elections. Suppose, suppose, there's none of the opposition deaf, are there? No, but why deaf, ma'am? It's a pity. If only one of their side was deaf, he wouldn't hear the division bells ringing, would he? And if he didn't know the vote was being taken, we'd win. But even a deaf man would hear the division bells tonight, with such an important vote coming on. But suppose something went wrong with a bell, and it didn't ring? He'd hear the other bells, ma'am. But if this bell didn't ring? What made you think of that? Why, a couple of years ago, something went wrong with the wire to that bell, and it refused to ring. The Premier missed the division, but it wasn't an important one, and I got a new wire put in the next day. That bell? It might happen again, mightn't it? Hardly likely, ma'am. And if the Premier's bell didn't ring and he was in here, that would mean only an extra vote to the opposition. I wasn't thinking of the Premier, Gregory. Wait a minute. She seats herself at the table and scribbles a note, puts it into an envelope, addresses it, and hands it to Gregory. Please take this to Mr. Harrington at once. Mr. Harrington? Uh-oh. But I'm afraid there's no chance of him attending to it till after the division. I depend on you, Gregory, to make Mr. Harrington read this note before the vote is taken. You must... Mrs. Power, you don't mean to say... There's not a minute to waste. I'll get it to him, ma'am. I'll make him read it. To himself. Women. They'll dare anything. He hastens out. Helen watches him till the door closes, then goes quickly up to the division bell, places a chair beneath it, mounts on it, rapidly strips one of her long gloves from her arm, and stuffs it carefully between the striker and the bell, effectually preventing it from sounding. She jumps down, replaces the chair, contemplates her work with satisfaction, seeing that the glove does not show, smiles, and returns to the table, where she sits in the Premier's chair, impatiently waiting. Harrington enters, with her letter opened in his hand. Vernon, it was good of you to come. Mrs. Mrs. Power, why did you write this? I felt I must see you to make it up. It is too late for that. Well, then, to tell you that I am sorry. What the hell is the good of that? Vernon, won't you forgive me, even after the cruel way I've wronged you, if I say I regret? You bring me here at this hour of the night, when every moment is of importance, to talk? To explain? The thing's done. Finished. There's nothing more between us. And I've no time to waste with you here. I've got more important business on hand. So you won't forgive me, Vernon? I came down all this way because I reproached myself with my unkind treatment of you. Oh, well. But I can't bear your leaving me for the last time as you did at Wyanora. Won't you just shake hands? Goodbye. Vernon, hurriedly taking her hand. Oh, yes, I'll say goodbye. Helen, holding it eagerly. Vernon, before you go out of my life forever, I must tell you something. I have made the greatest mistake a woman can make. Ah, so you have found out already. 
So as a husband... Husband? He's not a husband. He left me the very hour we were married. Well, he has made an honest woman out of you, hasn't he? That is all you wanted. Vernon! Recalled to her purpose. I thought I loved him. I don't. Oh, why? Why didn't you take me from him? Her hand caressingly on his arm. Vernon, it's you. You I love. I've always loved. It's you I love still. I knew it. Is about to draw her to him when he hesitates and looks at her suspiciously. No, you're trying to fool me. Trying to persuade me to let your husband off. No, fool that I was not to see it. You're trying to keep me here to prevent me recording my vote. How could you think that of me? I know I deserve your suspicions, but, Vernon, how could I keep you here against your will? No, I'd hear the bell. Of course you'd hear the bell. Vernon, you can't know how he treats me. He said things to me just now that made me desperate. He flung me off. He almost struck me. The moment he left, I scribbled that note to you. I mean every word of it. I don't care. I don't care what happens. His wife, after the things he said to me, never. I'd like to show him. He has driven me to it. Vernon, can't you see? Here's your chance to revenge yourself on him. Revenge? I'll have my revenge the minute that bell rings. Isn't his defeat revenge enough? No, there's a greater one. When he returns from the chamber, defeated, perhaps even wanting my sympathy and forgiveness, then, if I can tell him to his face that I've taken my revenge, too. You don't mean... the hint you gave in your letter? I mean everything. Everything you could read into that letter. Everything that I've said. I will tell him that here... In this room of his, I... Ha, yes, that would be good, but let me tell him. I don't care who does, but I know I could hurt him more. His wife. He called me... He was right. Vernon, I know you love me. Love you? By God, yes, Helen. Mine. He crushes her in his arms. But suddenly his old suspicions return. He puts her from him. No, it's a trick. A plot to keep me from voting. No, I'd hear the division bell. He takes her again in his arms. Helen. My Helen. Savagely and triumphantly. His wife. Vernon, kiss me. Vernon, about to kiss her, suddenly smiles. Wasn't that the screen he found you behind that night? The dear old screen. Come. He almost carries her behind the screen. After a pause, power comes striding in, triumphant. We've won! Harrington didn't vote! He's disappeared! He pauses as he sees no sign of Helen. Why, she's gone. Must have gone to the ladies' gallery. He turns to go. A slight sound behind the screen arrests his attention. Why? He strides over and flings the screen down. Helen is seen, standing by the window, as if she has just repulsed Vernon, who stands angrily regarding her. Arrington! Here! The vote? The vote can't have been taken. You didn't vote, so it was a tie, and we won by the Speaker's casting vote. And we've adjourned till next week, when we'll have our majority back. But I don't understand. Oh, Mr. Harrington, and I kept you. I'm so sorry. You. But the division bell. I were looking everywhere for you. Nobody thought of looking in here. Mr. Harrington would stay chatting. But the bell. He goes quickly up and looks at the bell. He discovers the glove in it, unnoticed by power, and reaching up is about to take it out when he stays his hand. To himself. A trick. A woman's trick. 
to power coming down. I must congratulate you. Thanks. It's all the luck of the game. Oh, not on your victory, but on your wife. To Helen, meaningly. I must thank you for the... the pleasant little chat we had behind that screen. It was worth losing the premiership for. Good night. He goes off. Power, puzzled. So he was here all the time. Helen, you kept him here? It was fortunate that I did, wasn't it? You did it on purpose to save me? It wasn't much to do, was it? But the government's victory, and on that resumption of empty estates bill, means that we must go on with it and pass it, and you'll lose why Nora. My estate? I never thought of that. I was only thinking of you. But I don't understand. How did Harrington come here? I sent him a little invitation. I see. But how did you manage to keep him here when he knew the vote was coming on? <laughs> he must have forgotten all about the nasty vote. Harrington? Forget? Why shouldn't he? I was rather nice to him. And I can be, you know. Or rather, you don't know. Yet. Power, whose puzzlement had been growing to suspicion. But Harrington's no fool. He did the division bell. With sudden passion, jealously. Helen, you kept him here, you say, chatting with you, when he knew the importance of this vote? He stayed here, behind that screen, with you, with that division bell, and all it meant to him clanging in his ears? My God, Helen. I told you I had to be rather nice to him. Nice? Yes, you women know how to be nice. You in Harrington's arms at the very moment when I thought I had him beaten. Oh, you. You saved me, yes, but the price you paid. You. No, I won't say it. You're my wife, you bear my name. But go. <laughs> Why, Bill, you're jealous. Really and truly jealous. Jealous, yes. Jealous of my wife? My wife? No, jealous of a woman who could hold that man in her arms, who could stop with her kisses the sound of that damned vision bell. There, you are jealous. I do believe, husband, that you're really in love with me. In love with you? God forgive me, yes. Madly in love, and with a woman who is no better than my wife. But I had to flirt the teeniest little bit with him, hadn't I? Flirt? With that bell dinning in his ears? What bell? The division bell over that door. I didn't hear any bell. No, you wouldn't hear it. That bell up there, you say? I really cannot recollect it ringing. Perhaps it didn't ring. It didn't for your lover, nor for you. And I married you. Breaking down. Helen, why? Why, when I must never see you again? Must I want you so? I knew all along you loved me. So this is goodbye. It must be. Then I'll go. Looking on the floor. Dear me, I've dropped my gloves somewhere. Look behind the screen. Of course. Goes up and looks. Not here. I wonder why I really believe there it is, stuffed in the division bell. In the bell? He goes to the bell, and reaching up, extracts the glove. How? Stupid of me to forget. I put it there myself, before I sent for Mr. Harrington. You see, Bill, I didn't want him to hurry away. It didn't ring. And he didn't know the division was being taken. And you? But Harrington said. He said it was worthwhile. Bill, you don't believe that I stuffed up that bell for my own sake because I wanted him. You can't believe that. No. I knew it. I had to be rather nice with him to lead him on. Of course it was mean of me, but it was for you. 
but bill it did seem a long time before you came in another minute and i would have called for gregory gregory was listening at the door as i came in he knew then of course he was a fellow conspirator holding out the smooth glove it hasn't crumpled much after all has it and yet did that for me oh you'll have to buy another pair of gloves you ought to be able to afford it your premier still ah you've made me more than that you've made me your husband he embraces her curtain end of act three end of mrs pretty and the premier by arthur adams